Bolivia, South America, heartland of the Andes. Three champion mountain bikers will attempt to cross these high rugged passes following ancient Inca trails. The trails are little more than stone steps built for feet, not wheels. This may be the most difficult mountain biking ride ever attempted. the Tibet of South America. This rugged South American Republic is small, isolated, and poor, but has a rich, enchanting history. The Incas were just the last of many ancient civilizations to live in this near vertical landscape. The Tiwanaku preceded them, and the Stone Age Viscachani people before that. The Spanish conquistadors arrived in Bolivia in the early 1500s. In addition to exploiting its mineral resources, they planned to convert the local Indian tribes to Catholicism. But it was eventually the Spanish who were assimilated like the other invaders before them. The Andes dictate the terms here. As far back as the 7th century BC, the Tiwanaku culture built a vast network of roads to connect the coastal areas of what is now Peru with the jungles of the Amazon basin. To do this, they had to cross the high Bolivian Andes. The Tiwanakos and the Incas that followed did not use wheels. The roads they built were for foot traffic. No one will ever know if the Incas simply didn't get around to inventing the wheel or just didn't see any use for it. Three champion mountain bikers have come to Bolivia to test their skills on these ancient trails. They bring with them three distinctly different disciplines. Downhill, endurance, and trial skills. Their goal is to successfully cross the Andes and drop down into the jungle on a pre-Incan trail known as the Camino Yunga Cruz. Hans Ray is a world champion trials rider. Hola, welcome to Bolivia. To win a trial event, he has to perform very difficult moves on his bike without ever letting his feet touch the ground. The moves can be fast or slow, but they must be precise or he will fall over and lose points. Sarah Ballantyne is a several-time world champion cross-country racer. Endurance is her strong point. She's just returned from Morocco where her team won another grueling race, the Eco Challenge. It was, it was really exciting and it was, it was really awesome to be traveling among the Berber people and all the different tribes and, um, and Team Vail did awesome. That's pretty cool. Ira Vick is primarily a downhill rider. Speed over rough terrain is his expertise. He's young and fearless and has quick reflexes. And Hans has taught him a few trials tricks. The team begins their journey in La Paz, the capital of Bolivia. This city spreads out from the rim of the high Altiplano down a giant canyon to the suburbs below. There's a huge drop in elevation between the two. The Hotel Oberlin, where the bikers will meet up with their outfitter, Sergio Baivian, is at the lower end of the city. The mountain bikers see this as the perfect opportunity for a long, fast downhill ride. Wow, this is cool. Check this out. La Paz, huh? It's like a big abyss. Well, it's a cemetery. It looks like they're having a little festival down there. Guys, yeah, like Dilimani in the clouds over here. And somewhere wow. down there is Sergio. Good luck finding him. <laughs> yeah. What about dropping in right here? Well, we better start somewhere. Let's do it. Cool. There's a trail actually, guys. I'm on a trail here. We started from up there, dropping into La Paz um, to meet with Sergio, our guide. And it was quite an adventure just riding down into the city. And there's actually some really nice riding down the crater um, into the city. We 
road down a long cobblestone road. It's pretty bumpy, which ended up being pretty fun. After a long cobblestone cruise, the group finally finds the Oberlin Hotel. Hey, 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 hey. Hi. Hi. How you doing, buddy? All right. It's good. I'm glad you made it. Did I show? That's me. All right. Hans. Yeah. You're? Ira. Ira, how you doing, buddy? All right, good. And Sarah. Sarah. How are you? Good. Good to meet you. All right. Oh, it was cool. Yeah? <laughs> a little right. hard to find you here. <laughs> yeah, it's a little bit tucked away, but, you know, I figured if you can figure this one out, you can do the rest, right? Yeah, first test, right. eh? <laughs> first test. The logistics and route are discussed as they look over maps with Sergio. We're going to leave out of La Paz, take the road out between Irimani and Mururata, continue all the way down to Chuñavi and Lambate, and we're going to take the trail that's going to go through, called the Yunga Cruz, going to go through the pass, just maintain itself high, then going to get into the jungle part, and eventually we'll end up in Chulumani. Anybody have any questions? So nobody has ridden that trail on a bicycle? No, not that I know of. No one's ever done it on a bicycle. So we tried to ride in the youngest one time, and it was just impossible, and I'm, I'm not talking about... Jeff Wemmer has mountain biked in Bolivia several times before. Dry, He'll help Sergio guide the team. Steep, but we tried to get in there and spin up these things, and it was just unbelievably gnarly. Just mudslides everywhere. It's pretty, I mean, it's pure virgin territory for mountain biking, for sure. So maybe we find some Inca gold out there on those trails. <laughs> well, we do, I get 10%. <laughs> <laughs> it's just not a treasure in the first place, isn't it? Like, it's still out there, man. The first destination for the bikers is Lake Titicaca. It is the second largest body of water in South America, covering approximately 3,500 square miles. The Tora reed boats can still be seen on Lake Titicaca. Historically, they've been used since before the Tiwanakos, but are primarily a tourist attraction now. We decided we should do a little trip, uh, mainly to get acclimated to the high altitude, and we wanted to see the birthplace of the Inca, which is uh, the island of the sun, which lays in the middle of Lake Titicaca. The group has arranged for a motorboat to take them over to the island and the Chincana ruins. <laughs> <laughs> Isla del Sol was an incredibly fascinating trip because it was the uh, birthplace of the Incas. This is pretty rad. In the middle of Lake Titicaca here, over there is the Peruan side. We're still on the Bolivian side here. And up there is the cave where the, ori the Incas originated apparently. So we're going to go and check that out. According to ancient legend, the sun shed its first rays on this island at the time of the original creation. Then the sun placed his own children here to instruct the natives and lift them out of their savage condition. We rode on the island of the sun, we checked out all this riding, it was really a really beautiful place, really interesting place because the island of the sun is known as one of the three power point of the Inca, you know, and they even say it's, it's, it's very connected with Cusco and also with Chichen Itza, which is up in Mexico. Well, we're in a cave where the Incas were born, and we're uh, only about 100 yards from the Chincana Inca ruins over here, where the virgins were kept for the Inca rulers when they were in Cusco. And over here is the sacrificial table that was done for sacrifices and other uh, services like that. Right. It was just a point of emergence. Exactly. It went... Like pop right Here, we are. Here we are with our golden spike. Forget, the, forget the God thing. There's some extraterrestrial spacecraft landed here. They explored the Earth. They decided we drop a couple of people off here as an experiment to see how they can live in this environment. And they sent them out to see what they can do. <laughs> Ride 
plotting the length of the island from north to south and ended up at these Inca ruins, which are Inca stairs. They actually ended up being pretty steep and pretty technical. The interval between stairs varied, and some were really big, so. I ended up going over the bars there, which was, it's all right, you know? I go over the bars a lot sometimes. And that's how it's done, folks. Yeah. The art of an endo. On this long flight of Inca stairs, the advantage of Hans's trial riding skills now becomes evident. Yeah. All right, come on. Now we go up. Okay, let's go again. <laughs> I'm with you, Hans. Hopping from step to step is sometimes the best way to travel. Oh, my God. Following the Inca Trail from Lake Titicaca to the High Andes brings the riders back through the city of La Paz on market day. Saturday afternoon market in La Paz. Check it out. It's a scene. <laughs> <laughs> Following local custom, the group purchases various sacrificial items that they will offer to the Pachamama or Earth Mother. Pachamama is the most important deity in Bolivia, sharing herself with the people, assuring good crops and good luck. These offerings will be burned at some appropriate moment along the trail. Near the lower end of the city, they find an irresistible temptation, the Valle de la Luna, or Valley of the Moon. We came across this Valle de la Luna, which is Valley of the Moon, and it just looks trippy. It's basically what it is, I think, is a bunch of rain eroded sinkholes with little trails on razorback ridges. Wow, check out this place. This is awesome. Wow. What do they call this place then? Valle de la Luna. Uh huh. Valley of the Moon, huh? That's what it looks like, huh? Let, let's write that thing, Ira. I gotta. I see absolutely no possibility for me, so you guys go have fun. All right, you hang here for a minute. We're gonna check out these trails. All right. Right there is rich, Ira. I had to brush up on my trial skills a little bit and sketch me out a couple times. There's super narrow lines with just deep crevasses. If you were to fall in, you'd have just been trapped down there. It was the perfect kind of playground to to ride some trials and get some air and just have fun with it. So we, we, me and Ira played around in there for an afternoon. Yeah. It was, it was 
kind of sketchy. If you made a mistake there, you would have lost some skin at least. Valley de la Luna is not a comfortable place to take a spill. changing Andean weather is always a concern for the biking team, but the riders are acclimated now and ready to tackle the most serious part of their journey, the unridden Yunga Cruz trail that crosses over the high Andes. We started our journey. Our first stop was to head down to Lambarte, this little town in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> falls earlier each day, indicating the rainy season has started sooner than normal. The bikers are getting worried. They consult with Jose Carmelingi, who is one of their Bolivian guides and who knows these mountains well. Yeah, it would be hard to, to skip a camp tomorrow. Yeah. Because it's a, long, it's a long day, huh? It's a long day. Being in the Andes, the weather changes so quickly. I mean, you can have sunshine one minute, rain the next minute, sunshine again ten minutes later, or hail. I knew that these Inca rocks and steps would be extremely slippery when they're wet. It's quite steep. Oh, yeah, it's on the hill. The danger of a bad fall will be much greater with the rain, and it could mean a lot more walking than riding. We were prepared for the worst. After a cold, rainy night, the weather breaks slightly the next morning. But now, the group has a new worry. The children accompanied us out of town. They were all running behind us and were all excited about our bikes and us doing that trail, which is known to be pretty hardcore. But they also said that we would all die on this trail because, and mainly because of this legend of the snake living in that lake, we were going to camp. So it was kind of spooky, you know, all these children running around there and saying, you're gonna die. It was scary. I think I kind of kept those feelings to myself, but in the back of my mind, I was kind of, what are they talking about? You know, is there a bunch of weird stuff going on here that we don't know about yet, and what's coming up? Later, I found out that's why that they were saying that. It was This trail we're doing was mysterious, and the place we passed by, this lake, they thought was haunted. Children's ominous warning had dampened the mood of the group, but a good break in the weather begins to lighten their spirits. When the sun came out, you know, everything, it, it tends to make everybody and everything feel a lot better. Oh boy. I'm talking. They continue their traverse of the Andes on one of the many grueling uphills that they will encounter. Eventually, they are rewarded with some spectacular views of the high peaks, especially Ilimani. Oh, what peak is that? Ilimani. I got the hanging glaciers. I think it's 6,400 meters. 
What's that, like almost 20,000? Or? It's even like 21,000. Really? Yeah. <laughs> We're not even looking at the summit though, that's pretty amazing. Good, there's some high mountains here. That's the Andes. You want it, you got it. The group continues onward towards the next village, Chunabi. <laughs> Chunabi is the last village they will pass through until after they cross the Andes and reach Chulimani on the other side. Hans gives the villagers a demonstration and changes forever their view of what can be done with a bicycle. I'm a one-hander. Uno más. Okay. Alto. No, nobody moves, nobody gets hurt. Nobody moves, nobody gets hurt. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> 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 well, my goal on this trip is I want to be the first one who rode this Jungas Cruz trail. It's the old Inca trail and according to many locals I've talked to, nobody ever written this on a bike or tried it even on a bike. This is the official start of the Camino Jungas Cruz. Follow me. My main objective is more like to stay on my bike as much as I can without getting off. I'm, I'm aware that this is going to be very technical and gnarly, especially in the wet and with the slippery rocks. And sometimes it's very steep, so I'm sure we have to get off our bikes a fair amount of times. And that's cool. I just want to be the guy who gets the least amount of time off, off his bike. The weather started turning. This really cold um, cloud front came in and, and before we knew it we were in the middle of fog where we couldn't hardly see the trail anymore and it got really cold and chilly out there and you know we were like thinking oh my god if it's gonna be for that for the next five days we're in for something for sure. It's gone from cool to cold and windy. Tents are quickly assembled. Over here and sweep a few out of my area, please, Ira. Um, sure. You're gonna go over there in those ruts? I don't know. I don't like these ruts. I'm gonna sit up behind you guys. There's here. some right there. I kind of cleared out this whole area. It's kind of brutal though out here. Well, kind of looking brutal everywhere. Free <laughs> flatter down here. Set this thing up. Where you been, Hans? Oh, I've been riding the mountains off the plane. When we first woke up the next morning, it was pretty cold there because we were on the shady side of the mountain. And within like half an hour, we were in the middle of this cloud and it started raining. We were pretty high elevation, it was getting pulled out. We didn't know if 
the mule drivers are gonna want to go in the rain and they're out there packing up stuff and they're bare feet and sandals and no gloves and I got two gloves on and two pairs of socks on and can't feel my toes. It was beautiful about 6.37 storm rolled in within an hour, a couple hours. It's gone from better to worse for sure. Uh, here we are in a complete fog out, probably visibility 100 meters, 150 meters. And uh, with the fog is, of course, some pretty serious precip, uh, sort of mist, sort of rain. And uh, now we're just trying to scramble and get the camp packed up so we can take on this next leg of our journey. And uh, it's going to really add. It's not that. that dramatic. Come on, it's just a little rain. <laughs> Let's go, guys. Getting ready for the ride for the jungle, dude. <laughs> <laughs> there were serious doubts about what the heck we were doing that morning because I'm visualizing mudslides in the jungles and I'm thinking, oh man, we're just going to be pushing our bikes and this is going to be really bad. At that point, everybody was like, uh-oh, we just started this trip and we just hope it's, it's going to change around. And it was a pretty hot day that day because not only were the trails extremely slippery, it was cold and windy and the visibility was really um, difficult. actually cleared a little bit later. I mean, it was off and on, kind of foggy, misty. It wasn't as bad as I thought it was. It was actually better to keep moving, you know. My toes and fingers were still numb, but but my body was temperature rose just from the exercise, from the hiking. me a ski lift here. I'm beat. Feeling the elevation. It's like one minute you're sweating, the next minute it turns ice. We came through that pass over there. And down this trail to those ruins. Now we're doing basically a hike from hell. Luckily it's got some switchbacks in it though. Soft grass. A ten hour day of riding brings the bikers to the supposedly haunted Lake Kasiri and their next campsite. hardcore out here. Packing up wet, setting up wet, and I don't know if we're going to get any more sunshine. I don't think so. I'm hungry. I could eat a bear. Nobody told me we're going to skip lunch. That's why I'm going to poke your eye out now. Our mule drivers were very skeptical about the route we picked on this trail because we went by this haunted lake which apparently had this snake in there which eats people and they really didn't want to spend the night there. So they felt like they had to do an offering to the spirit of that lake. Local people believe that this place is haunted. 
And it is said that once upon a time there was a huge rattle snake living in this lake. I mean, they are afraid that the snake come back anytime. Here, the Andean people that lives in the countryside gets everything from the earth, agriculture, water, animals. So they believe in a divinity that's called Pachamama, that's the mother earth. And every year they have to give back something. And that's what we have made right now. We have made what is called the table. We prepare the table so Pachamama can eat. So we put several things, a lot of sweets, a lot of symbols, llama fat, uh, llama fetus, and just burnt it. That's the way all these ashes are going to go back to Mother Earth. We are doing it because we want to have a nice trip, not rain, we need some sun. So we are offering it not only to Pachamama, but also to the mountains that live around here. I mean, every mountain is also a kind of god. Kasiri is the local lord, let's say, of this place. Kasiri Mountains, the peaks that we have behind us. So the offering goes to them and to Pachamama too. And while this thing is burning, we should ask for good weather for the rest of the trip. After that ceremony, the weather changed for us really unexpectedly because um, the indication was really like bad weather. After that, it was just like a blessing. So who knows what we did to the spirits there, but I guess they liked it. That whole ceremony was really an uplifting experience and a, and a positive experience. And um, I believe Pachamama could have been an element in, in the way that the weather changed for the better. Where are you, Hans? Hans? Speak to me, Hans. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> I have risen from the lake! The following day after we stayed at the lake was one of the more hardcore days I've ever experienced on a mountain bike in terms of difficulty and also endurance challenge. I mean, we climbed up this valley from behind the lake and to top of the highest path of our trip, which was at about 14,000 feet. And from there on, the real Inca terrain, if you want to call it, started out. The trail was so hardcore that, I mean, it was about as hardcore as the trail can get.
Oh, that was some rad lines back there. No, this trail's like, it's super fun, but it's super hard. And it works you. It's a workout. I just noticed myself fatiguing, riding down these stairs and oh, coming to a stop and hopping this way. And These guys are too gnarly for me. Chocolate, anybody? Me and Hans both agreed that, you know, we were getting tired and we could make some pretty easy mistakes and the consequences were pretty high. This is easier than I've been doing. Woo sit around this corner here. Holy moly. Yeah, you guys, this is gnarly. They, they want to ch check this out. The challenging thing was the high amount of difficult sections in that trade. To drop off. The key is when you're in these situations, focus on what you want to do, not what you don't want to do. For me, the challenge was to ride more than anybody else would ride. And but since everybody was so concerned about this place, I figured, all right, we got to at least try this. We've never done any riding like that. It's, I've done sections like that, but never like three or four hours of just straight riding of the most technical sections I've ever ridden. It was just intense. Ball. This is exhausting. I like this trail. I like it when it gets technical. <laughs> this is about as technical as it gets. Hans is a nut. This is pretty much like miles and miles of the pretty much the craziest stuff they'll put in a race. And the problem is, is it's on a cliff. <laughs> Man, I'm beat. I'm so tired. This is the funnest trail I've ridden in a long time. Woo. Once we started um, getting fatigued, there was, of course, some crashes. Number five! You can't avoid them. And if you think you're not going to crash on a trail like this, you're foolish. I had one endo on the trail where I just oversaw a little rock because a lot of these steps, they weren't like the steps you have in front of your church at home. Oh, oh I'm just going to sleep here tonight. <laughs> Hans and I actually had one of the best days riding of our life. It was beautiful, it was technical, it was challenging, it was, it was fun. This camp, Hans, tell the time you got here, we've been here for a day and a half. Right. <laughs> well, you didn't do it twice like I did. Oh, you got lost? Only three times. <laughs> <laughs> I think you got lost. <laughs> he got lost. <laughs> After we had our big day in the high mountains, 
and we saw that was like as extreme as it can get. Our mule drivers told us this is nothing. The the jungle is gonna be much more hardcore. Welcome to the jungle. Woo! The riding in the uh, Yungus compared to the Andean mountains is a lot more slick mud, a lot more moss, covered rocks, a lot less traction. <laughs> in the Yungus, your, your visibility was obstructed by ferns and um, vines and, uh, you know, whatever was just dying to reach out and rip you off your bike. A lot of the the trail was was very badly eroded. It was overgrown, and we could hardly get through with our handlebars. And it was actually quite tough to maneuver a bike through these sections. It had these really deep ruts where actually you couldn't even push your bike through because your pedals were hitting on on e either side, and you either had to find the high line or kind of straddle your bike through it. And it was pretty hardcore. I mean, we were really like worried about our mules making it through there because um, it, it was some sections were so narrow and slippery that it just seemed impossible. about it was these bamboo vines that were super strong. And sometimes they'd hook your handlebar and pull your handlebar back or they'd hook your neck and you'd like get jerked back. <sighs> well we know that the Inca has used that trail but nobody has told us that nobody has used that trail since the Inca. We were quite exhausted coming out of the jungle. It was such a hard day there in the heat and bushwhacking and carrying our bikes and riding these, these hardcore sections. Is so, um, it trains you so much. The trail was definitely the most demanding, challenging trail I've ever tried to ride. <laughs> this is definitely the, the hardest trail I've ever ridden, I have to admit. We crossed the Andes, went through the jungle, and reached a jungle town, which is Chulamani, and definitely felt a sense of accomplishment. We made it, guys. Oh, wow. Right Check that out. There it is. Oh, that, that was most brutal. That was intense. Chulamani. Jungle section. Man, nobody has done this trail in a while, I'll tell you that, how grown in that thing was. I bet our meals are going to be in tomorrow morning. Cervezas! Let's go! The nice thing about riding the Yunga Cruise Trail was knowing that you follow um, in the footsteps of the Incas 
also dealing with the culture of the people we meet on the trails, the mule drivers accompanying us, we're very nice, very simple people. Um, going through all these different climate zones was just incredible. Um, from the high mountains to the jungles, it was something very neat. I love uh, true adventure, and, and this was absolutely a true adventure. This trail was extremely demanding. It's quite a sense of accomplishment. I mean, this, this ride was definitely hard, and to kind of pioneer the ride, it was a great feeling. Yeah! Yeah! <laughs>